Asher Bud? We're gonna go over here, okay? okay. Go get your go get your Good evening. Good evening. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to Christmas Eve service at Three Crosses Church. So we prepare to light the uh, Christ candle. Mama, what's this word again? Here, extinguish. extinguish. Hear these words. Extinguish. Yes, from John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness doesn't extinguish the light. Okay, come here. Put it up there. There we go. Good job. Yes. Y'all both want to go back and sit. Asher. Yes. Put it in there. Yes. Right there. So I'm a big believer that as a leader, you never ask somebody to do something that you yourself are not willing to do. So you've heard this past four weeks that several people, because all their talks started the same, it started off, Leah sent me a text message that said, call me when you get a chance. And they go on to say that I asked them, instead of doing the reading, to do a personal testimony for lighting the candles. And each one of them says I was very, they were very nervous. Well, I understand that feeling because I'm very nervous. So tonight we light the Christ candle. I can remember the day like it was yesterday. The day that I knew everything was going to. Let me rephrase that. The day that I knew that everything had to change. But I also remember the fear. Because I couldn't predict or control the future. I had been praying for a miracle for a long time. I had been bargaining with God you know, that kind of bargaining. God, I will do anything if you just make this better. I think there was even a point that I knew I was going to have to walk the path before me. And I knew that God was going to use what I go through. I knew that God was going to teach me something through it. But I was also saying, God, I'm a really good learner. I can learn things from books. I don't have to learn things the hard way. I was praying mostly for a cure for a sickness for a loved one. A sickness that is absolutely terrible. But also a sickness that is often kept quiet because it has such a stigma attached to it. I have heard mental illness be referred to as the non-casserole disease. It's just something in our world we don't talk about. I had tried everything within my power to help that miracle become a reality. The miracle I wanted was not going to be part of my story. Imagine the disappointment and the heartbreak. I could have turned from God. Although God did not give my loved one the illness. But it hit me one day. If I turn from God, one, he's not going to turn from me. But two, if I turned, I'm turning away from the only one who can hold me through this. And turning away from him would be me refusing to let the only one who can put the pieces back together again do just that. So I decided that turning from God was not an option. 
So I dove into the scriptures. Y'all, if you want to hear from God, we have God's word. And I came one night to John 21, verses 21 through 22. It says, when Peter saw the disciple that Jesus loved, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain until I come, what difference does that make to you? You must follow me. My broken heart had been screaming at God. God, you can do this. You can bring healing. I had picked up an autobiography, and part of the lady's story was close to mine. Her, her husband had a mental illness, but her story was that the mental illness had become manageable. That moment, God gave me peace after I found that scripture. I realized that I'm not called to compare my story to everyone else's. My call is to follow Jesus no matter what. That was the first moment that the light shined in the darkness and the darkness did not over extinguish it. There was also a Jason Gray song that I have enjoyed for years called Remind Me That You Are Here. Basically in the song, the song says, I'm not gonna ask you why, God. My prayer is just for you to remind me that you are here. Remind me that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not extinguish it. And that you are Emmanuel, God with us. I started praying, God, just let me have the ability to see you. And God did just that. His light shined in the darkness. It was like God had a megaphone saying, I am with you. His light shined through his word. Scriptures I have read for years glared off the page at me. I often tell people that if you're struggling, you are praying, reading scripture, and it does not seem to be helping, maybe that means you need Jesus with skin on to be that light that shines in the darkness, to remind you that God is with you. I saw the light in the darkness with Jesus on with friends and family that would show up with hugs, show up with smiles, show up with prayers, show up with long talks that had a lot of truth in them, even though I didn't want to hear the truth out of times. People who showed up just for my kids. Saw the light of the world with skin on. God in all his wisdom has been giving the world his word from the beginning of time. But he knew that for redemption to come, he would have to come and take on flesh. We needed Emmanuel, God with us. So tonight we light the Christ candle to remind us that Christ is the light that came into the world who took on flesh, took on all our brokenness, our sins, our illnesses, so that through him and only through him, you and I may be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Would you pray with me? Gracious, loving God, Jesus, you came into a dark and broken world. You came in the middle of a mess and shined your light, and the darkness tried, and it could not overcome it. So tonight we come on this Christmas Eve celebrating your birth, celebrating you taking on flesh to re be reminded that no matter what we face in this world, that there is no sin, no brokenness, no illness, no addiction, nothing we can face that you have not already conquered, Jesus, and that you are holding on to us and help us hold on to you. Gracious God, we come tonight and give thanks for the light. We give thanks for that light that shines in the darkness. And we come forth to praise it, but we go forth to proclaim it. Because that is what Christ must is all about. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and join us now as we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
service uh, where we give thanks to God for all that he's given through our tithes and offerings if you'll go with me to the Lord in prayer gracious loving God we know that every good and great gift comes from you above Lord we ask that you take this gift of our tithes and offerings knowing that scripture teaches us that our true offerings to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice so God not only do we place our gifts we imagine placing our lives at the foot of your cross as our offering, for that is our good and pleasing and spiritual worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture this evening comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Hear the word of the Lord. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord has spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as the angel from God commanded and took Mary as his, as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be to God. Would you pray with me and for me? Gracious, loving God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be holy and pleasing in your sight. Our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I think if we're not careful, when we think about the Christmas story, we turn it into almost a fairy tale. If we're not careful, when we think, about what we are celebrating this night. We said it in a perfect setting. But the truth is, Jesus, the light of the world, enters into the world with an unwed teenage mother, and his parents, at least his dad, his earthly father, contemplating divorce. Jesus enters in. His very beginnings is entering in to everything that would make the 
the legal experts entering into everything that would make what we know as the church leaders go, I'm pretty sure that's what the Pharisees did. Just like that. Jesus, from his very beginning, before he's even conceived, Jesus is set to enter into the darkness of the world. The Christmas story begins in darkness. It begins in brokenness. It begins in a family just like yours and mine. Amen? There you go. It begins with us in a mess. And you know what? If it was perfect, if, there was, if it didn't begin in darkness, then Jesus wouldn't have to come. So this morning in church, we looked at Mary. This evening, we're going to take a few moments and we're going to walk this story with Joseph. And Joseph is known as a righteous man. And we're going to see what this righteousness looks like. Jesus, when he grows up, he'll tell his disciples, unless your righteousness is, goes beyond the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, those are the church leaders that was Ugh, to Jesus. Unless your righteousness exceeds them, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. So what does that righteousness look like? So this is how the birth of Jesus took place. Mary's mother was engaged to Joseph. Before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You can't hide the pregnancy forever. So Joseph was bound to find out. Says from the beginning, Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off the engagement quietly. So let's just picture what's going on, just for 30 seconds. Here's this man who's been waiting for this wife. And I think it's safe to assume that he loves her. Because I don't think he would have done what he did if he didn't love her. But here's essentially what's happening. Because of his righteousness, he is laying aside what he's entitled to. If you and I are going to be righteous as a biblical standpoint, it starts with laying aside our entitlement. Laying aside what we're entitled to. You see, those church leaders and everybody around him would have said, Joseph, make her pay. Make her pay for what she did. Obviously, we know that this is, might be the craziest story we've ever heard, but obviously, this isn't what happened. Make her pay stoner and stoner in the public and get your revenge. You deserve it. You're owed it. But Joseph, righteousness possibly higher than that of the Pharisees and Sadducees, he's going to divorce her quietly. And here's what it means to divorce quietly. Not only means is he laying aside what he's entitled to, laying aside his revenge that is legal. What he's also doing is that he's taking her shame upon himself in this moment. You see, what he's doing when he's saying this divorce is going to be quiet, he's saying, I'm not going to tell you what she did. That means when somebody, remember, we talked about this morning, Nazareth, think Marshall County. That means when somebody at the local marketplace is going to say, hey, what happened between you and Mary? He's going to say, none of your business. I don't know, that's, what, that's how Leah Howe would put it. I'm pretty sure Joseph had a better vocabulary than that. 
but he's going to let people talk about him because what's going to happen is people are going to make up their own stories and people are going to say, look at Joseph, that lousy man. How dare he get her hopes up and just flatten her? Or what they're going to think is that Joseph had his fun with her and then left her. He's going to take on her shame, her sin, her guilt. Joseph, in this moment, Jesus' earthly father is taking on Mary's shame and guilt. Now that, not only did he have to let go entitlement, he took on pain that wasn't his. Like I said, for a woman he loved, righteousness higher than the law, I would say. But then it says, as he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Think in our righteousness that's greater than that. We learn that we've got to be prayers, prayer warriors. When it says Joseph is thinking about it, he's really contemplating it. I almost think he's praying about it. I mean, he knows the law. He's a devout Jewish man. So he's praying about it. He is seeking God and asking what to do, I imagine. He's not just going with, well, this is what the law says. This is what the church says. He's saying, but what is God saying? What is God saying to do? So our righteousness leads to seeking God. The angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because she told you the truth. The child that's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Second step, righteousness. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what people are going to say. Don't be afraid because you can't see what the future holds because you don't have a crystal ball. Don't be afraid because I'm not going to tell you everything that's going to happen. You're just going to trust me. So our righteousness says, don't be afraid. And you will call him Jesus. You'll save his people from their sin. We're going to come back to this. And the last word of the righteous is when Joseph woke up, he did just as the angel from God commanded. Second, last point of righteousness, I don't even know what number I'm on, that's okay, is obedience. Obedience without question. And you see, Joseph wakes up from this dream, and he says, all right, this is what God says, I'm going to do it. I don't know, maybe I'll watch too many Hallmark movies, but I imagine him running to Mary's house and saying, and saying Mary, I love you. And I know that this child is from God because God told me to. And in my world, she would say about time, but Hallmark world, they kiss and they live happily ever after. But I want us to look at Joseph and look at Jesus. Interesting to me that what we see in Joseph we also see in Jesus every single one of those characteristics. Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus said, Paul tells us Jesus laid aside his entitlement. That he humbled himself and came to earth. Not what he laid aside what he deserved to come and step into our brokenness, to step into our soap opera lives. And then just like Joseph was willing to take on Mary's shame, Jesus, let's get this back. What was his name to be? Jesus. Because why? He will save his people from their sins. There we go. Jesus took on our sins. And you know what our sins are? Let me tell you. Tonight, 
You know, I don't, I don't know where you worship usually, but let me tell you, a lot of times what you hear preachers talk about sin, you hear them talk about, gosh, you hear them talk about hell and wrath and fury and damnation. And you hear them talk about, a lot of times if we're not careful, we fall into the legalistic. Remember, our righteousness is higher than the Pharisees and Sadducees. So if we don't get beyond this legalistic... And we can do that by the Holy Spirit. I'll get you there. But sin, let me tell you why God, I believe God hates sin so much. And I'm sorry, Tom, I can't stay in one spot. <laughs> let me tell you why I think God hates sin so much. It's not because he is some tyrant or some kid with a magnifying glass and we're a bunch of ants. And he's say, he, 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 you sinned, so now you're going to burn. Let me tell you, what does sin do in our lives? Sin causes us to turn away from God. Sin causes me to turn my back on God. God never turns his back on us. Sin causes me to hurt. Let's take a sin. I almost said somebody wants to shout the sin, but I can do this. <laughs> Let's take the sin of jealousy. Ever been jealous? This is one time I don't want you to raise your hands. What does sin of jealousy do? It consumes us. If I'm jealous of what you have, all I'm thinking about in my life is how I don't have what you have. And all I'm doing is thinking about how I can get what you have. So am I seeking God? No, I can't love God when my mind is all consumed with jealousy. Am I loving my family? Absolutely not, because that means I'm not spending time with my family. Am I loving myself? Absolutely not. Jesus tells us we love God, we love people, and we have to love ourselves too. So take that. And I have turned away from God, but also what's happening is that jealousy is eating me alive. That sin without God doing anything, that sin in itself is killing me. The wages of sin are death, and I can become like the walking dead if I can't control that sin. And that's just with jealousy. And guess what? Jealousy is legal in the United States to a certain point, to a certain extent. But God says jealousy is a sin because of what it does to us, because of how it hurts us how it eats away at our soul. The wages of sin are death. And it's not just physical death. There is people who are walking or spiritually dead and who are almost just a shell of a person because they've been consumed with jealousy, bitterness, unforgiveness, idols, whatever you name. So Jesus comes in and takes to save us. From those sins. Jesus comes in and says, Yes, sin owes the punishment of sin is death. Jesus says, Okay, I'm gonna go to the cross. And on that cross, I'm gonna take on flesh and be born in a manger. You can't have Jesus in the manger and not talk about the cross because if you separate the cross from the manger, you just have another baby born. So we have to go to the cross. So we put, Jesus goes to that cross for you and me. He doesn't deserve it. But because, just like Joseph loved Mary, just because Jesus loves us, he took on, and on that cross, he took on the sin of us not wanting to turn towards God, of us wanting to build our own kingdom. And we can name sins and put them up there. And Jesus took them on. And then he died. And in his death, he defeated and he paid the punishment for our sins, which is death. So when he rose, not only did he but provide forgiveness for our sins and defeat our sins so that they don't have chains on us anymore, he paid the penalty of our sins, and that is death. So that through Jesus Christ, anyone in here no matter what you've done, no matter if you've killed, if you steal, 
if you have abused, if you have been lost, if you've been to the very bottom, guess what? That light still shines. That no matter what anybody in here has done, if you give and hit your knees and give your heart and life and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Jesus, I want you to be set free. I want to be set free in you. Jesus Christ comes and he sets you free. There is no other name in heaven of which the sinner is set free. The, un, what, the one who believes they're unforgivable is forgiven. The addict finds hope and restor, restoration. The sick finds healing. The blame, the blame. The lame finds the ability to walk. And the dead are raised. That is the Jesus Christ that comes and saves us from our sins. Then we have God with us, Emmanuel. So we don't serve a God that made us and is far away. The day I knew I wasn't getting my miracle is one of the times I felt God the closest to me. Um, I've told the church before, because I'm a mom and the bathroom seems to be the only place I get three minutes to myself, <laughs> so, sometimes that's where I end up. And it was on the bathroom floor, and that's the closest I've ever felt Jesus in a long time, was sitting on my bathroom floor, knowing my miracle wasn't going to come the way I wanted it. <laughs> and that and it helped me take the next step. Jesus, God, Emmanuel, is with us on the bathroom floor. He's with us in the foxholes. He's with us when we're on the mountain. God is with us. We just have to learn to see him. So, in our righteousness, we're not righteous on our own. It's only through Jesus. When we give our life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes, lives in our hearts. And he starts this really cool process of transforming us, of changing us. Guess what? He came to be like us so that we can be like him. That's what he did. Y'all, God came to, went to be with us in Jesus to make us like Jesus. How cool is that you and I get to be like Jesus? I think that's pretty cool. Amen. <laughs> and that's what we lean on. It's not our own righteousness. It's not our own goodness. It's Jesus. It's God with us. So today we are invited to come to his table. This isn't Three Crosses' table. Three Crosses, whose table is this? Jesus. There we go. I was worried just for a half a millisecond there. This is Jesus' table. And Jesus invites all to his table. And all means all. There is, when Jesus invites you to the table, he invites you like you are. In this very moment, in this very moment, he's inviting you to come and meet him at the table. To come and be reminded what he did for you. To come, if you even want to think about, as you take the bread that is his body, think about your sins that he took upon the cross, this baby born in a manger. So you think about the blood that covers your sins. All are welcome at this table. There's no reason in this place for anyone not to come because it's Jesus inviting you. And on the night which he gave himself up for us, this baby born in a manger, on the worst possible night of his earthly life, you know what he was thinking about? You. He was thinking about you and you and you and you. And I have scripture to back it up. And the scripture that back hits up is that Jesus prays. 
on the night in which he gives himself up for he prays for his disciples that are with him but he also prays for those who will believe because of their testimony and that's you and i how cool is it to think jesus has prayed for you jesus he also prayed for you on the worst possible night of his life and on that night he took bread he broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take eat all of you this is my body that is broken for you as often as you do this do this remembrance of me after the supper was over he took the cup gave thanks to God and gave it to his disciples and said drink from this all of you this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many poured out for you and the whole world as often as you drink this do this in remembrance of me would you pray with me Jesus, how sweet is that name? Jesus, we, none of us here deserve to come to your table. But you, because you invite us, you not only invite us, you want us at this table. Jesus, you say in your word, I have longed to eat this meal with you. And Jesus, maybe somebody here needs to hear that tonight. Maybe somebody here tonight feels you feels that tingling in their heart that's the holy spirit that is jesus knocking and say i have longed to make my home in your heart maybe tonight somebody feels that warm feeling tingly feeling in their heart is the holy spirit and it's jesus saying your name just imagine jesus saying your name i long to eat this meal with you Please come to my table. So gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your Holy Spirit. Make us one with Christ and one with each other until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet when there is no more illness, no more sins, no more chains, no more pain or death or crying or suffering when we feast at your heavenly banquet through Jesus Christ our Lord and we see the final victory and all honor and glory and praise is all now yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, those who are going to help me serve, please come forward. The table is set. The feast is prepared. Jesus has called you by name. Please come.
Now, I invite us to stand. Does everybody have a candle? For those of you who can. And as we come to the table, we know that Jesus saves us from our sins. We also know that he's Emmanuel, God with us. This light reminds us that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't extinguish it. I often point out, if you can notice our candles up here, the flame has no shadow because there's no darkness in light. So I'm going to take my candle. I'm going to light it from the Christ candle, who's the light of the world. And I'm going to start candles down the row, and we're going to light each other and share with each other the light of the world as we sing.
Jesus is born. He's our hope, our love, our peace, and our joy. So now take the peace and love in Christ with you as you take the light out into the world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.